Baroness Casey's review of the culture and standards of the Metropolitan Police has been published and I'm delighted to say that Baroness Casey, Louise Casey, is joining me here to talk about it. Can I ask first of all, when you had started on this uh, over a year ago, what expectations did you have about how it would end up and actually have they ended up very different from, from what you thought? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is that obviously the Commission um, came in the sort of light of the murder and the murderer of Sarah Everard and I knew from the outset therefore that this was a pretty huge moment uh, in terms of police and policing history that you know one of their own had committed such a heinous serious crime in the middle of a sort of pandemic I mean it was just an off the barometer and I myself felt um, as a woman and as somebody that's lived in London, you know, an awful lot of my life, I was sort of thinking, God, you know, here we are, men, misogyny, sexism, you know, that's the most extreme end of it. And, you know, um, how horrific that was on every single front, the use of his warrant card, the use of his power, the use of his position. I mean, how much more could you abuse that before you end up actually killing that young woman in the circumstances that he did? And so... In the light of that, there was a sort of, wow, I wonder how the police are going to be in relation to that. And though they were very upset, um, or sort of very upset by it, very uh, emotional actually by it, what I found interesting was that what didn't run alongside that was a kind of, well, where does that leave us as an organisation? So on a human level, I could see that they were thinking, you know, good God. Um, on an organisational level, I wasn't sure that they stepped into the responsibility that comes when your organisation does something quite so horrific. And I suppose at the beginning, therefore, when the commission came, I think it was more around, are you go like, McPherson did racism, and Louise Casey isn't going to come in and do sexism and misogyny. And so, there were two things. First of all, I wasn't sure that they realised what I had realised is just how huge uh, the, the, the murder and murderer of Sarah was. And secondly, I thought that they just thought, you know, I was coming in to look at the issues of misogyny and that basically they would show me that they'd gone a long way, that, you know, we have our first female commissioner, they had strategies, they had lots of um, campaigns and initiatives and I actually think they thought I would find some things that needed looking at but overall I would say good job, on you go. And you haven't found that at all, have you? It's the exact opposite. Um, sadly, sadly, it's the exact opposite. I mean, in my own mind, I think I found an organisation that is essentially broken in its core purpose of if you can't trust the police to police themselves, to uphold their own standards, to not have criminals in their own ranks, and not just criminals but misconduct, if you can't trust the police to deal with that, where does that leave us? when, you know, put bluntly, a bloke with a warrant card shows you his warrant card and says, get in my car. I mean, it's that, it's that extreme. And I think that you would build back from, therefore, how on earth do you deal with that? And I found an organisation that, you know, didn't see this as a plane falling out of the sky where everybody would look at it and think, how did this happen? What did we do? Have we got our safety procedures right? Do we have enough you know, too many people on the plane, too few people on the plane, did we get the all right? No search for that. What I saw was, this is a bad apple, the vast majority of people are good, and if we don't hold that, if we don't stand and say, vast majority of people are good, therefore stick with us, they couldn't hear it. They couldn't hear the fact that that wasn't working and probably hadn't worked for quite some time. And then this happened. And of course, not long after, um, Reverend Smallman's girls, her daughters, were photographed by serving police officers for fun. Um, and you just sort of think, when did the police service become people where 
that was seen as okay. It's like, where is this, you know, great person you see on the telly that's upholding justice and, you know, standing alongside rape victims and trying to get to the baddies when you've got cops taking photographs and WhatsApping them to each other. So the organisation has lost its way. Um, and I think that's what, that's really what my report says. And that certainly comes across loud and clear from, from your report. And I'm going to go through some of the issues in the report, not all of them because it's an exhaustive report, 360 odd pages. But I wanted to start first of all with public protection and the Met's response to violence against women and girls, because you would have thought that would be a priority after what had happened. But that's not what you've found, is it? Um, you detail some really worrying findings Half of the women in London don't have confidence that the police will keep them safe. Officers working in, in sexual assault uh, investigations have unmanageably high caseloads. You found freezers crammed full of evidence samples, which are overflowing, frosted over and taped shut. Um, and the child protection sort of um, departments, which have been heavily criticised by inspectors, you said the Met had just not listened and learned. I mean, it's, that's appalling, that whole, that, that whole series of findings. Well, it is an organisation that's lost its way when the key job of the police is to protect the vulnerable. And if we can't protect women who are victims largely of male violence, it is the male violence that makes them victims, and if we can't protect children, then again, I ask myself, what are we doing in terms of law and order and criminal justice? And I think what happened during a period of austerity, so you, know, you have to gift some of this, that you have to say, look, there's just to be balanced here, that the Met alongside many other public services was cut uh, during 2010 onwards. And you start to see how that bites post to the Olympics and then into sort of 2015, 2016, you can see that austerity is really cutting into the organisation. But then, of course, as organisational leaders, you have to make choices about how you cut things and how you, you know, change things. And I'm not sure that the largely male leadership, both at that time and probably even currently, realised quite so uh, sufficiently that they essentially threw women and children to the wolves, that essentially by, by deprioritising, by removing the specialism of their public protection services, which means looking after people who have, women who've been raped, serious sexual assault, um, child abuse and those sorts of things, they lumped all of that into their basic command units, which I have no problem, Danny, with the physical change of moving locations and putting people together to save money. But what they did was throw them in alongside every other little bit of policing rather than holding it as a specialism. And I think that's really important because we also say in the report that essentially what you have is what's traditional high volume crime like burglary you see that going down at the same time that recorded, uh, re recorded domestic violence, uh, sexual assault and those sorts of crimes are going up. So at a time that essentially they deprioritised, despecialised, removed the ability to get forensics done anytime soon, all of those sorts of things. Loads of experienced uh, officers left at that point because they were like, what on earth? And essentially you end up with, you know, a young detective halfway through a major Crown Court rape trial, fortnight rape trial, uh, you know, halfway through that, the middle weekend, she's pulled out with no, 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 nobody could stop this from happening because public aid, i.e. the bit where they're pulled out and, you know, put onto the street to police football and all those sorts of things, she had no choice but to be pulled out. And that, I think, is symbolic of how the Met sort of treats its public protection work. And, you know, don't get me on the fridges and freezers because I think that is symbolic. It is so symbolic that, you know, last summer, one of those uh, 
freezers, broke down and defrosted in a heat wave, and all of the rape kits. So these are women who have been raped or allegedly raped. We have a rape kit done. It's not a nice process. It's all bagged up. It's sent uh, the police station, puts it in its freezer, and when that freezer defrosted, they lost all of those rape kits, which mean they lost the ability to essentially proceed with those cases. And so I think in a way, if you, you, know, if you were serious about this, you would make sure at least you could deal with the specimens properly. And we've got accounts from people. It came up everywhere. And I think it, it, what came up everywhere was, well, we can't even get fridges. And in a way, I think if, if an organisation can't do something as basic as that, I ask myself, how on earth are they going to deal with public protection more generally? But you have said that there is a caveat, which is all the cuts to the Met Police and also a growing population in London as well, and a different mix of cases coming in, which complicates things as well. I mean, in your report, you're, you're very critical of the Met. Have you been perhaps a touch too harsh and not borne that in mind? Some people might say, just look at the backdrop. We can't make all these reforms. We can't do this. We had to make some really tough choices about where we put our resources because of those cuts. I think real term cuts of is about 18% or something in that order. It's, it's 0 0.7 billion uh, in r real terms between 2010 and currently. The answer to that is no, and I'll tell you why, because it's the fifth largest public sector organisation in the country. It's the, they say it all the time, the best police force in the world. And essentially you'd expect them to have a workforce plan, they don't have one. You'd expect them to know where all their people were, they don't. You'd expect them perhaps to have a kind of central record of training, they don't have it. They found it very difficult to tell us how much money they were spending on contracted services and consultants. So I'd gift them that as well if I also didn't see that back in some of their firearms, they spend money like it's dropping off a tree. So over in your specialist services, they're incredibly protected to the degree that they can go out and buy you know, night vision, uh, things off their own volition, thousands of pounds, that won't work in the City of London because we're light most of the time. So, so there are bits of the Met where money is no object, to put bluntly, and there are the bits that touch us, that touch the women and the children of London, and touch the, the, the members of the public in London where they made their choices to withdraw those and protect and protect and protect their um, more elite services and I think that that's not acceptable Danny. I just don't think you can do that and I also don't think you can do that and not say that you've done it. So this pretense that we have safer neighbourhood teams, of course they don't. don't, don't have safer neighbourhood teams. I've lived in London for years, I'm, you know, I'm the mystery shopper of the police service in London. I know what a safer neighbourhood teams looks like and I know what I've got in Finsbury Park right now. It's light years away. So even if they'd made those choices, tell me what those choices are. Don't spin them and say that everything's OK, because it's not OK for the women of London. And it's not OK for people who are living in communities that are poor and hard pressed and have no police service whatsoever that's on their side. And that's, why, that's how we've ended up in London. You talk about spin, and that really plays into this culture of, of the police force that you talk about in your report and runs through your report this culture of we know best optimism bias I think you describe it initiative itis where they you know bombarded with initiatives from the center but never get really carried through and a culture of denial can you explain or give an example of what you really mean or what you saw for yourself or your team saw about this this sort of defensiveness and this we're the Met, we know best culture? So my review starts with the rape, torture and murder of Sarah Everard. And they got upset but stood outside New Scotland Yard and used the word, the expression, bad apples. And it ends with Carrick 
who is the multiple rapist, when he was sentenced, that the Met stood and said, this couldn't happen in the Met now. Of course it could happen in the Met now. That actually nothing has so sufficiently changed. It will. I trust Mark and Lynn to change it. But nothing has sufficiently changed to tell me that they have a vetting, misconduct system that can root out the baddies and stop, stop the baddies getting in hasn't changed so sufficiently that I can look you in the eye and tell you that your daughter, your wife, your son, whoever, is not necessarily safe from um, sort of both heinous crimes and misconduct. So I think that the, the problem I have with the Met is that right the way through, their way of change is initiativitis. So, you know, you have not in my Met, so that's kind of right, everybody, don't be racist, don't be sexist, don't be homophobic, and if you are, please leave. And then everybody had to be told those are the messages. Well, we know that in some police stations around London, prior to that message being delivered, people were told, get your WhatsApp groups and clean them because somebody's going to come and get you. We also know that that type of initiative lasts for a few months and then peters out. So in the report, I go through a diary of some of the initiatives that have happened during the course of my time in the Met, many of them around the issues of um, racism, sexism, behaviours, cultures, conduct, misconduct. Um, and you see them come into the organisation from the top, from New Scotland Yard, and then you see them move into the borough and what you have is really daft things, like somebody somewhere is saying, can you count how many times people have said the former deputy commissioner's top three asks? So somebody on a local borough then as a paper exercise is ticking a box to see whether it's been mentioned enough. And all of this lets down. I mean, the people I really feel for are the officers and the staff, actually, who get up every day and keep going, despite the people that bring them into disrepute and the leadership that doesn't lead and doesn't manage. But where does this defensiveness come from? What's that about, this, this culture of we know best? Is that, is that something that's just come down through the ages, that the Met's the biggest force and, you know, Scotland Yard, detectives? Because, you know, from what you're saying, there's not very much to be proud of. Well, I mean, isn't that interesting that I think there's two things. I think the first thing is, as a sort of industry, as a profession, policing's out of date. So, you know, they don't recognise sufficiently that a police service will attract the really good people that want to protect the public, want to stand for justice, really believe it, really motivated, and there are plenty of those attracted to the police service. Over here are plenty of people attracted to the police service because they'll hold power, because they'll get a truncheon, because they'll get respect for being uh, sometimes overly brutal. And an organisation should look for both. The Met and the police, I think, look at one. So I think, you know, think of all the changes that have happened in education and happened in children's services, where even if it's flawed, Danny, at least they know their job is to look for people that are paedophiles, frankly, that want to get near children. And so you have to have systems that stop attracting, you have to have systems to check if people who are paedophiles or have you know, histories in the area before they get into the system for having children. We don't have that same culture in policing. We don't have it in the Met. I think the other thing is it's like, it's like, a, it's like a professional humiliation and they really don't like it. They really, really don't like it. There's something about being humiliated by the fact some of their people have got it wrong. And it strikes to them in some way that they don't feel able to admit it. And perhaps that's because they think if they admit it, then we'll lose trust or faith in them. Do you see what I mean? So I think they're in this vicious circle where I would say to them, a plane fell out of the sky uh, and actually, you need to take a long, hard look at yourselves and work out how you win back the trust of people and what are you getting wrong. Not stand there and say, we can't admit any of these things 
because it'll only make public trust and confidence worse. Well, last time I took uh, public confidence and public trust, can it be any worse? It's certainly been falling hugely. Um, I want to turn to discrimination because this is potentially your principal finding, certainly the finding that's making the headlines. You come up with a finding of institutional racism, sexism and homophobia in the Met. Now it's been labelled institutionally racist before by the McPherson Report 24 years ago, um, but you've gone further in terms of sexism and homophobia and some of the examples in the report are really distressing. Um, and you talk about a willful blindness to racism in the Met, that you saw sexism in plain sight. You actually, you and your team actually witnessed it. Um, and two examples in particular, you've singled out the Firearms Command as a boys club with insidious attitudes and the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Command, an insular, stagnant uh, culture um, and there's one example of a black officer being described as a gates monkey, um, guarding the gates of Downing Street, presumably. I mean, reading those findings, that's shocking. What was it like sort of uncovering that? Well, it's awful, isn't it? It's like, you know, I want the police to be great and I want to actually have them on a bit of a pedestal. And so I think that... I think that I felt so disappointed, really, that it was as well, disappointed isn't the right word, it's sort of gut-wrenching to know that essentially you've got racists in the organisation that you're not rooting out. You've got people experiencing racism in your organisation that you don't care enough about those officers to do something about it. You've got systemic bias that they agreed, Mark and Lynn agreed in October that there was systemic bias. And then, of course, you've got the very clear evidence that the black community in particular in London, both historically and to this present day, is over-policed and under-protected. And there I go to this sort of addiction, really, uh, of, of the police, certainly in London, to stop and search. And so if you just look at those four things and the evidence behind those four things, they tell you that we haven't really grasped what McPherson was talking about. We've not really ever seen the trust in the black community in London go up in relation to policing. And what we now see, the data tells us, is that, of course, other Londoners are joining that group in their experience of policing. And so I think what's happened is that misogyny, of course, and sexism which is so, so huge in the Met, um, it, and actually I think in the way the Met then, their, atti the, their attitude towards they would call public protection, it's like, why would you de deprioritize the services to women who've been raped? I mean, who on earth would think that that was a good thing to do, particularly if you're worried about serious violence, or if you really want to tackle serious violence, wouldn't you look at what's happening in people's homes when it comes to domestic violence, which of course we know accounts for such a huge number of homicides. Your finding from, from your extensive review is institutional racism, sexism and homophobia. That's a really stark finding and there will be many people within that organisation and others who will say, mm, we, 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 we don't agree with that. Okay, we've got problems and she's identified these problems but you can hear people going, no, that's too far. But, I mean, certainly recent commissioner, I think, denied that institutional racism was still a problem in the Met. So how important is it that the Met accepts those findings, or are you willing to say, OK, well, this is my view, that's your view, fine? Well, I'm not very good at that. Um, that you know, I'm not very good at, you know, I've been in there a year, We've had access to the Met in a way that I think nobody's ever had. To be fair to them, the door was open. They've shared with us all of their data. Um, you know, we've analysed more of their data than they've analysed themselves. Um, you know, unless when you when a mirror is held up, you have to look in that mirror 
and see what's in it. And that's what this report is. You can't pick and choose. You know, people don't wake up in the morning and today they think, I'll be racist on a Monday, I'll be homophobic on a Tuesday, and I'll have a little go at women on a Wednesday, and then I'll say a few things that are horrific and how they describe disabled people on a Thursday. I mean, human beings don't come that way. Discrimination, and you look at the bullying statistic in the report, you, know, you look at the discrimination, you look at the bullying, and it tells you about a culture that is widespread. And so racism, misogyny, or sexism, homophobia, and actually using the expression mong about a disabled person. You found that, did you? Yeah. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's, a true, that's a true example, uh, and, and not an old example. So I think, like... The job of anybody in a scenario who's responsible for that organisation isn't to pick and choose which ones they want, it's to accept the overall position that actually denying bits of it or saying is very classic Met, isn't it? So you write a report, somebody does a load of recommendations, you get the recommendations, you strip them apart and you do one of these and two of those, that's not going to change the Met, Danny. It's not going to change policing. So the Met has to accept that it's institutionally racist, sexist and homophobic in order to sort of start to move on. Is that what you're saying? Do you know, there's a quote from somebody in the report that says, we've had so many watershed moments, we feel we, we're drowning. And so I suppose the issue for me is, as human beings, unless we understand and accept the truth and the whole truth, it is very, very hard then to work out what needs to change. So you could, of course, have another go at the misconduct system. You might put a few more officers into public protection. God willing, they'll sort out the freezers. You then might throw some more police officers into neighbourhood policing. And then, you know, you will then might say, we've got a new anti-racist strategy. You know, everybody says, I like to be anti-racist, I must be anti sexist, being anti-something is easier than accepting that you're it and your organisation has to change. So for me, unless you accept all of that, you remain in denial. And as long as they're in denial, they'll lose consent. I mean, we have essentially... So they have to accept. They have to accept it. They have to accept the totality of it because it's the culture, the totality of that culture that has to change. It's not just about the Met, though, is it? Because are you, are you letting off the hook, the Home Office and the Mayor of London? They, the, you know, the Metropolitan Police Commissioners are accountable to the Home Secretary and to the Mayor of London. They've had warnings, and you've pointed them out in your report. There have been warnings and problems have been highlighted previously over the years. And yet the accountability system, you say, is dysfunctional. The watchdog doesn't have any teeth. Um, so why hasn't the Home Office sorted this out? Why hasn't the, the Mayor of London sorted this? You don't really seem to... It's all down to the Met, it seems, to, in your report. You're not really... You know, shouldn't you be actually saying the levers of power are in Whitehall and, and with the Mayor? So I think the Met can choose to change an awful lot of what it needs to get done. And I don't want to throw them some sort of lifeline that says, unless they get a new power, therefore they don't have to tackle their misconduct, or unless they get an additional government grant, they won't be able to sort out neighbourhood policing. It's like they have a significant levels of resources and they should be able to do, you know, they, they need to get, you know, from from the recruitment to the vetting, to the training, to the induction onto a basic command unit in a borough, through to how you supervise them, it isn't working. And that's not just about money. So I'm very clear that if I then say this is everybody else's fault, because that's what they always do, every time you talk to them about change, they'll go, well, yeah, I know it's bad, but have you seen it's even worse in that force? Or can you show us the ranking so that we're shown that we're not the worst, we're the third worst? Or, um, well, you know, until you, until you change the regs, it's the regs, Gov. Until you change the regulations, we won't be able to make all of those changes. And I'm saying to them that as a responsible public body that is a, close to a four billion turnover, it's huge, that the management of that organisation 
could be better than it is and that the values of that organisation do not reflect the Pelian principles set out almost 200 years ago that stand the test of time today, which is we're a country that polices by consent and they have lost that consent and they can't blame that on everybody else around them. They have to take responsibility for that. That said, Mr Shaw, (laughs) I'm absolutely clear that I think the hands-off approach of the Home Office um, to how... So if you think about what we have in education or what we have in local government, so very different set of circumstances, but I did an inspection into Rotherham Metropolitan Borough Council (coughs) specifically around child sexual exploitation, but was the whole council. When we finished there, we were so sure that they couldn't run themselves at all that essentially the government used its intervention powers to remove the leadership and we installed three uh, former chief execs of local authorities into Rotherham to run Rotherham for a period of time. That power doesn't exist in the Home Office. They don't have that power. Um, Even pre-2010, I would argue that HMIC, uh, sorry, Her Majesty's Inspector at the Consadbury, as was the watchdog, have more powers and certainly have more intervention. They They would take more intervening than happens at the moment. So I think since 2010, we've had a bit of a, you know, Theresa May, when she stood up and said, just cut crime, okay, the hands-off approach isn't working. Um, It just isn't working, and I don't think it's the right structure. As to the Met and the Mayor, I think that they need to see that, you know, we observe their oversight. Uh, You know, we've been there. You know, we've watched that incredible moment when somebody said to the former Deputy Commissioner, um, well, you know, how many detectives do you need? And he went, what have I got, a crystal ball? You know, it's so symbolic, really. And I know he was being flippant and all the rest of it, but at some level, I was like, no, I, no actually, you should have a crystal ball, actually. You, <laughs> you know, your, your job is a figure for that. And so, so what you see is this organisation is like a, a clam, and what this report has done is opened it up. So I think that they've been really hard to scrutinise, really hard... Uh, Mopac, the mayor for London, has no levers to open them up. He can keep going and going and going, but it isn't open. We've opened it up. He and, needs does the mayor of he London now, needs he is going levers, to, new powers. Well, he certainly is going to establish what I've asked him to do, and he's agreed. Is this new uh, London policing board that he will chair, with um, external people appointed to it all of which he can do within, within his existing powers. But what powers will it have to force, to effect change? Well, in at the, the moment, it's still in, you're still in scrutiny and you're still in oversight. And of course, you know, I am an interventionist uh, by my very nature. So, of course, I think when things fail to such a degree, like Rotherham, I, I do think, like schools... So, you know, Ofsted have powers, they can... To step in. So do you, do, you, do you think we're at the stage where someone needs to step in and take charge of this organisation and sort it out? Someone from outside? So, well, I think that the appointment of Mark Rowley, um, if there hadn't been a new commissioner, and actually he's managed to get Lynn Owens, that could have been a commissioner as well. So we've got a deputy commissioner who is essentially, you know, extraordinary, gifted, could have been the commissioner herself, and we have Mark Rowley as the commissioner, I think that gifts the organisation time, and I think it gifts them time. I think the report gives them the, the best diagnosis of, of you know, they, in their intray is this huge diagnosis of their organisation, where if they look and agree with the recommendations, if you took those as a whole and did them all as a whole, you would probably make quite a lot of headway within a few years. But I can't force them to do that. Two years and five years, I think you say you want to sort of do a progress review or progress report, but there's a warning in your report, isn't there, about if there isn't sufficient sufficient progress, then more radical action. What kind of action do you have in mind? Well, I think everything should be off the table. So I uh, or on the table. Uh, sorry, wrong way round. 
obviously I always get those things wrong. Um, I mean, I think that at the moment you can't justify um, splitting up uh, the Metropolitan Police because it's got new leadership. And I think that type of structural change might absorb too many, too many hours, too many days, too many discussions, while I just want more police officers that are capable of dealing with rape victims, where I want fridges fixed, where I want a 24-hour response team, where I want actually a better Box. service for Londoners, and particularly black Londoners. If that doesn't, then I would be in the basis of... Do you do regional? I mean, remember, every basic command unit in London is the size of a force outside London, where they have their own police crime commissioner uh, and their own setup. So it's really interesting that London is like 12 forces outside London. Uh, so their options, and also I've also got a view, which is you split national from territorial policing in London, which is. You know, people have asked me to think about considering that now, and I don't agree with that now. I think that that would not be the right choice because at the moment I'm saying this isn't about structure, it's about management. And Danny, we have new management in town, so we get behind the new management, who I think have got it. And then I, if I was in Sadiq's shoes or the Home Secretary's shoes, I would definitely be wanting to know. I wouldn't want to leave it five years and just see black Londoners still still not having any trust or confidence in the police and women and all of those things. So I think it would really help focus everybody's minds if, if actually they knew that there would be like the equivalent of what we've just done and you know, take a week if it's all going brilliantly. You know, there, there are different ways that you can do these reviews, but at the moment there's no other mechanism to do it. So what you're saying is if there isn't tangible progress within a couple of years, along the lines of the recommendations, and, and you, what you're saying is they've got to basically accept the report in, in full and, and the very harsh conclusions, then radical options need to be on the table, including a restructure of the Met, splitting up the national responsibilities from the London-wide responsibilities and so on, or some other type of restructure you're saying that that should be considered at that point so you so the Met's kind of in the last chance saloon is that how you would characterize it um, yes I think the, the Met um, is is down I think if it can come up restructure itself within itself reconnect to London respect Londoners <laughs> respect all Londoners whether they're black whether they're white whether they're old or whether they're young whether they're a kid in a hoodie uh, on a bike, respect them. You you need their consent to you know to search them. So at least be polite. Um, so I think that you know from the micro of things like that to the macro of actually how they redo their public protection. Where, for example, I think we should set up um, we should reset up the specialist rate teams. I think that you call for a women's protection service. Actually, is one well, of you know that's a wider yeah. issue. I am tired. Um, I'm tired and weary of a country and public policy that does not take women and women's protection and safety as seriously as it, as it should do. And just going on about violence against women and girls, some of it is good, it's helpful, I'm glad people are doing it. Will it add up? Will it add up to fundamental change where we bring up boys so that they don't rape women and that we protect girls when they are under threat? And at the moment, I don't see it. And the way I don't see it, Danny, is I see stuffed fridges in police stations where women's rape kits are, you know, ruined because the Met can't get that right. And I see caseloads of fantastic trainee detectives carrying caseloads of 20, 30 live rapes. And when people say live rapes, they have to remember, I'm not being harsh about the Met. I'm being quite kind when I think of one of those live rapes being a woman that, you know, her rape kit sits in a fridge and then stays there, might go off, might change if there's a heat wave, with a kid that's 25 and a trainee detective who can barely keep on top of his caseload. And then, as you know, you go, even if you get through that bit in the police service, you then head into the world of the criminal justice system, which, as we know, doesn't treat women and victims the way that they should. When Mr and Mrs Everard 
are actually having to agree their victim impact statements with the Crown Prosecution Service, I know that we're not in the right place for victims. And you and I both know that victim impact statements have to be measured and agreed by the people that then read them out in court. So we have a topsy-turvy criminal justice system, but right at the heart of this, you've got what used to be the leading police force in the world actually not doing the basics. You know, they don't get the nuts and bolts right. Get them right, I'll be happy. Be the, bless, you know, be the best police service for the kid in Peckham or the woman in Finsbury Park or the elderly guy uh, you know, in Edmonton, and then, then we're on to something. And that's the most important thing that I want to achieve from this report. But if not, then what? Well, why would, if not, change it. If you can't reform it, change it. I mean, I think somebody much cleverer than me said that about something else, and I think that's so true. Yeah, and that's why you have governments. That's why you have mandates. That's why you have a, you know, Sadiq Khan has the biggest democratic mandate of any mayor in the country. If you can't fix it, change it. Baroness Casey, Louise Casey, thank you very much. Thank you.